Having a Coke with you is more fun than going to San Sebastian, Irun, Hende, Biarritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the tras, tras, <coughs> excuse me, Travesera de Gracia in Barcelona, partly because in your orange shirt you look better, look, look, look like a better, happier San Sebastian, partly because of my love for you, partly because of your love for yogurt, partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches, partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people and statuary. It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary when right in front of it in the warm New York four o'clock light, we are drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world, except possibly for the Polish writer occasionally. And anyway, it's in the Frick, which thank heavens you haven't gone to yet so we can go together for the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully, more or less, takes care of of futurism. Just as at home, I never think of the nude descending a staircase or at a rehearsal, <clears throat> a single drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them when they never got the right person to stand near the tree, when the sun sank, or for that matter, Marino Marini, when he didn't pick the writer as carefully as the horse? It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience which is not going to, waste, going to be wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. That's having a Coke with you, I'd like to say, by Joseph Campana, but we all know that's not true. I thought it was really important to start with a kind of queer forebear, uh, Frank O'Hara, with that magnificent poem about how important it is to be together and to be in spaces where art's really important. Um, I just wanted to say quickly before I introduce um, a series of readers I'm so pleased to appear here with, um, I wanted to thank Christina and Felice for um, uh, helping uh, for, for putting this program on. Um, I think um, it would have been a shame not to have a Stonewall 50 um, poetry reading. Um, what's going to happen from this point on is you're going to hear um, six writers. I'll introduce them now. Um, each will come up. Some will share some poets. Um, uh, some will, they, they will share poems of their own, but also some of them may share uh, poems of uh, some of our um, important queer forebears, like I just did with Frank O'Hara, and then I'll kind of loop back at the end. Um, so I'm happy now to introduce the readers in the order they'll appear, and they will all just process up, but I'll do all the introductions right now. Uh, Lyric Hunter, our first reader, her poems and prose works appeared in Cordella Magazine, Organism for Poetic Research, Pelt Number no. Four, Volume Four, and The Felt. She's the author of two chapbooks, Motherwort and Swallower. She was born in New York, in New York, New York, as she says, and lives in Houston, Texas. After Lyric, we'll read Justin Janice. Justin studied poetry at Yale University and the Iowa Writers Workshop. He's currently a PhD student at the University of Houston, with work um, appearing in or forthcoming in Copper Nickel, New Ohio Review, Columbia Journal, Yale Review, The All, Zocalo Public Square. He's editor-in-chief of Gulf Coast, Journal of Literature and Fine Arts, and the recipient of an imprint Marion Bartolme Prize. Um, Paige Quinones, and I'm happy to say she is one of the only, she is actually the only reader who's in this um, chat book, Miles from Disobedience, which you should check out and which is available downstairs. Um, she's a PhD candidate in poetry at the University of Houston, where she's also managing editor um, at Gulf Coast. How do the two of you have any time to do anything, sort of running that journal, I think is the real question. Uh, managing editor at Gulf Coast, that small job, right? Um, she received her MFA from Ohio State University in Columbus, and her work has twice been nominated for the Pushcart prize appearing in Copper Nickel, Crazy Horse, Hayden's Ferry Review, Poetry Northwest, Sycamore Review, and elsewhere. And she's the recipient of a 2019 Bartolome Prize selected by Gabrielle Cavalcarese. Next, Robin Riegler, a um, who is foundational in the poetry scene here in Houston. She's the author of Teeth and Teeth, winner of the Charlotte Mew Prize selected by Natalie Diaz, and Dear Red Airplane, from Seven Kitchens Press. She's the executive director of Writers in the Schools, Wits Houston, which has had so much of an impact on so many people in town. And she serves as the chair of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs Board of Trustees, also a very small job, right, you can, as you can imagine. Um, 
And then um, Roberto Tejada, um, author of the poetry collections include Full Foreground, Exposition Park, Mirrors for Gold, and selected poems in Spanish translation, Todo on la Hora, as well as uh, Cultural Poetics of the Americas, Still Nowhere in an Empty Vastness, which just came out and which is a really fantastic book. As an art historian, he's published National Camera, Photography in Mexico's Image Environment, a monograph on pioneering Chicano conceptual art titled um, Celia Alvarez Munoz, and catalog essays such as Los Angeles Snapshots in Now Dig This, Art in Black, Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980. Tejada is the Hugh Roy and Lily Kranz Cullen Distinguished Professor in Creative Writing and Art History at the University of Houston. That's our slate of readers. Um, so we'll start with Lyric, and I'll see you all in a little bit. Hello. Um, so let's see. I'll start with a poem by Audre Lorde. The Black Unicorn. The Black Unicorn is greedy. The Black Unicorn is impatient. The Black Unicorn was mistaken for a shadow or symbol and taken through a cold country where mist painted mockeries of my fury. It is not on her lap where the horn rests, but deep in her moon pit growing. The black unicorn is restless. The black unicorn is unrelenting. The black unicorn is not free. Um, thank you, Joseph Campana, for inviting me to read and to Felice and the Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston for hosting. Um, I will read my own poems in a second, but first I would like to read the work of my dear friend Shade, who is a queer black writer from Houston and who is a Virgo like Marsha P. Johnson. Sade Lane is a poet and artist from Third Ward. They lived at the Covenant House during her senior year of high school and found solace in the Rothko Chapel, the Menil Collection, and Half Price Books. Sade left Texas to study at the Pratt Institute and the University of Notre, of Notre, of Notre Dame. They are the author of three collections of poetry and the forthcoming I Love You and I'm Not Dead from Argos Books. Her poems are included in the Bettering American Poetry and Best American Experimental Poetry anthologies. Her writing explores the limits of language and creativity as a balm for systemic violence and generational trauma, specifically as it pertains to lives and bodies of black and queer people. They are currently working as an adjunct professor in Indiana. So I'm going to share two pieces. The first is a poem from her first chapbook, which is no longer in print. What I want my words to do to you. Fill your lungs like a song, their beauty irrevocable. Take the place of all the air when your seams begin to tear my words, will disappear, you forget they Wherever there, visit you in dreams, throw neon paint against the insides of your eyelids, the floor, essent, reds, and iridescent, yellows derail and reroute your rapid eye move, meant to strike you, lightning surge electricity through your bones and jangle through your cartilage and teeth, my words, a crisis. You can not escape dense night air rife with sirens and the urging of trains, sensational, as fireflies to your young heart. Catch them in a jar, watch them flare up, glow in the night, squeeze my words between your thumb and forefinger smear your skin with their phosphorescent shimmer. This poem is from the forthcoming I Love You and I'm Not Dead and serves as an invocation of literary matriarchs to assist one in preparing to do the work of one's life. Chorus of matriarchs, you open frequently. 
Anne and Bethany plant a field of sunflowers in the backyard, Alice pulls. Death, Francis and Harriet let the moon in. Through the windows, Wanda inherits 21 coins. Audrey richtet die Wege der Gerechtigkeit auf Caroline, Caroline and Georgia fling Florida water with sprigs of parsley. Harriet, Joker, Supler, Pauk, Up, Eosex at Ioja. Phyllis casts a circle with soda light. June and Arthenia arrive in the chariot. Pauline and Polly intercede to the high priestess. Alice and Mary grid the house with quartz points and salt. Sophia and Zora toast flaming sambucas. Lorraine blesses the obsidian and rose quartz eggs. Gwendolyn mounts two swords above the bed. Pinky runs a bath of peony and passion flower. Lucille fult neun tasse. And May and May Uf Milfe ihr Wow Jawa Upsa Saun Ali. Marita shuffles the deck in Tozake and Gwendolyn sage the house. Octavia and Octavia drag the devil out from under the bed. Tony fries ripe plantains and escovitch fish. R Amanda runt dun Raum. Ella and Nina brew ginger and echinacea tea. Ida charges 10 selenite wands with candlelight. Anne and Nella e Ray Kuluverk Fir Jayak Sirit Maya pulls the hermit sojourner closes the circle with aragonite. So I'm following up with two poems of my own. Um, the first is for my friend Devin Kenny, and this one is entitled The Southern Dark Eats Fluorescent Light. One at night. We study the constellation of burning cars, the smell of each other's mouths. It's a tender riot. Two, hold your hand up to the glass of the television to feel the breath of static. Now you are full of weather. Three, good morning, new riot, human right, exploding poem. Good riot, new poem, exploding right, human morning. Number four, do you enjoy dismantling systems? Do you enjoy a light riot? Are you tender weather craft? I am a city too. Five, I'm on track to become the city. I'm on track to become benzene transported by rail, then by air. I'm on track to start an environmental riot. Six, I am the beating black heart of the bayou. The sun is black, can't you tell by looking at my skin? The moon is a fluorescent light shining through the branches of a hawthorn tree in flower. And finally, a poem for Sade entitled Things in the Universe Collections. One, listening to the good black things to the universe listening to the black, black night. I'm moving slowly through the night, through the world, listening blackly. I like your sound. I like your skin. I like your brown word. I am not finished. I want in the black night, in the street, I am a synthesizer. Two, black spider legs, black January, black ice glittering, several black Rothkos. Catherine's calculations and May's moon eyes, the couplings of rail cars, the wet night, the Quran aboard Apollo 15 as it sped into lunar canyons, the soft sediment of the Gulf, of river deltas, the crude at sweet Evangeline, kisses, and black glass fired in the heat of the earth. Three. Space line center over the sloping grass bank, over the grasses mowed to keep the animals at bay, to keep the braids from falling forward over your face. Under the sprawling freeway, a momentous network, a monumentous guidance system maintenance. The water is in order. Coming up on the down line transit center, the city embroidered with bayous beaded with manned capsules, a soft stadium, a service road, 
Black land funds your manned spacecraft, black soil under your scaffolding. I'm an engineer. My money is in energy. My energy is soft. My sun is in Aquarius. How do you send humans to celestial bodies? The way they try to change the names of roads but fail. Humble oil. When space was new, I'm feeling softly disposed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Justin. Can you hear me? Okay. Flamingo Watching by Kay Ryan. Wherever the flamingo goes, she brings a city's worth of furbelows. She seems unnatural by nature, too vivid and peculiar a structure to be pretty, and flexible to the point of oddity. Perched on those legs, anything she does seems like an act. Descending on her egg or draping her head along her back, she's too exact and sinuous to convince an audience she's serious. The natural elect, they think, would be less pink, less able to relax their necks, less flamboyant in general. They privately expect that it's some poorly jointed, bland, gray animal with mitts for hands whom God protects. And I wanted to kind of start with that poem, not simply because as my friends know, I'm kind of obsessed with flamingos, but um, I think it's kind of a queer manifesto in a way, right? I think you can kind of pick up on that. Um, the natural elect, you know, they think would be less flamboyant, less pink, and you, you know from your, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, observations of, of the kind of rhetoric, the, uh, you know, that sort of often you know, homophobic rhetoric, right, often try to frames the discussion in terms of what's natural uh, and what's unnatural. So, uh, you know, uh, and she mentions that here. And, and the, the way that, you know, uh, it, for me too, it's almost sort of a personal manifesto that like the, um, I'm sure I'm not the only kind of queer person who's had to sort of deal with the the, the weird thing where people always think you're joking, <laughs> even when you're not, probably because often you are, but you know, then you have to sort of, <laughs> have to sort of uh, uh, compete with this idea that you're you know, always sort of entertaining people. Um, but I do want to entertain you tonight, so I hope you enjoy <laughs> my, uh, my poems. Um, this one is called Wigs Be Everywhere. And um, it's after, uh, I got this idea from uh, Karina McGlynn. She had, I had poem envy because she wrote this poem called Witches Be Everywhere. Um, and I, uh, so yeah, so I just want to give her credit for that. The brown squirrel coiled and clinging to the guardrail of my balcony is a wig. I stepped out of the shower to dry my feet on a damp wig. You can fold a wig in a certain way that it becomes a cup from which you can swig water or juice or wigski, which is whiskey distilled from fermented wigs. <laughs> I met Dolly Parton and she was all wig. Kristen Wig is a wig. So was Ludwig von Beethoven. In Britain, there used to be two political parties, the Whigs and the Whigs. There are wigs that are mops and wigs that seduce cops. In some countries, it is illegal for wigs to marry other wigs. Have you ever slept in a wig? It's itchy. The best wigs in life are free, but the second best cost extraordinary amounts of money. <laughs> Somewhere in Detroit, you can trade 20 small wigs for one giant wig. And the award for best wig ever goes to Medusa. I love how she'd rather lose her head than part with it, and how, even without a heart, the head maintains its awful power. The 
The podcast's love guru draws a distinction between adventure and relationship. And I'm sad for adventures, how they've been Disney-fied. A yellow raft down a plastic blue slide seats six. Same architecture as the minivan that in the commercial cruises from safari to soccer practice. How neatly we get our wildness packaged. And I'm sad for relationships. By implication, these somber adult affairs where everyone gets theirs and no one's allowed a cockpit visit to see the tops of clouds across a sapphire ocean while sitting in the pilot's lap, as if only children did things like that. Baptism by Firefighter. How his hands smelled vaguely of soot as he held them over my face, pinching my nose and plunging me into a blackness I will, I will forever call humility. How humiliating it was to perform the ritual of salvation with a man whose touch turned me to water. No man since has prayed for me like that. I've gotten the hang of it by now, how to invite a man to bed, how to sleep next to him, how to keep our bodies from burning. I have two more. This one's called Conspiracy Theories, which I started writing before the 2016 election, but sort of took on sort of added significance and I kept adding to it. Tweezers seem made to be jammed into light sockets. Lazy Susans take extra time to buy, install, clean. Everything he says, I take personally. Contact lenses, I pay to see what exactly? That a brick wall composes itself of bricks? I believe he speaks only to me. Why is there no vaccine for Dutch elm disease? The Pope is plotting to take away potato chips. I want to know what invulnerability feels like. And here, what has been said of the fervent exercises of the heart. Smoking causes happiness, not smoking, suicide. I take a deep breath and rise to my feet. I don't know what to do when I arrive. There is no actual US Supreme Court. Pursuit of pleasure continues from age to age and agitation and pursuit of things. You'll believe what they want you to believe. Someone kneels beside me and lays a heavy hand on my shoulder. Hired actors pick up recycling and toss it in a landfill. I surprise myself by weeping. And just so, just to sort of book in this with my flamingo obsession, I wrote this poem, Flamingo Sexual, which just came to me one day. If you just take flaming homosexual and drop three letters, you get flamingo sexual. And to make matters even just psychotic, I made it look like a flamingo, <laughs> um, which took like, it was like two of the like, like best hours of my life, like making the beak and everything. Okay. Flamingo sexual, suddenly aware of two pink bruises blooming on both knees I vaguely recall the way I threw myself into bed, back of the hand angled at my temple, a countess's swoon. I arise to find my necks out of whack, too many pillows, but I'm freshly in love again with the world that made me. Part candy, part fowl, two-thirds feathered boa, I am not your lawn ornament. I am the whole lawn or nothing, St. Augustine with patches of fine fescue. I have shrimp for breakfast, shrimp for lunch. I skip dinner to write letters with feathers dipped in the rosy blood of my enemies. Those who told me nobody was ready for a breed like mine. 
but I'm still standing and will until I can't. I like to think we all carry within us enough fuel for one last blaze of renunciation. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. That was great. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a part of a piece that we published in Gulf Coast in our last issue. We also did a 50th anniversary of Stonewall commemoration um, in various ways. We had some art by Tommy Linnigan Schmidt, who you can see right over there, like some of his pieces over there. We also had Celeste Dupuy Spencer, a conversation about her art, and she's on the cover, um, as well as poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. And, and Justin Torres actually curated a little section for us. And this is just one piece of one piece that he included in there, but I, I'm really attracted to it. It's called Polaroids of Photographs of Paintings of Film Stills by Brontes Purnell. Two, there was that one black and white photo of Coretta Scott King, not the famous funeral one, but another of her in her living room. Hair and skin immaculate and a stoic faraway look. It's ha haunted me since childhood. I thought, what a bother having Time Magazine in your face like that when your husband had just died. Though still, in moments of grief when I am alone, I often imagine that someone is there taking pictures of me. Three, I was sitting across from my altar to the dead in my bedroom. Right near a framed picture of Marilyn Monroe is a framed picture of my father. They shared the same birthday. I'm hesitant to draw similarities, but also can't stop myself. These two good-looking, well-styled, dramatic, self-destructive bitches. These two are the reason I don't fuck with Geminis. Geminis are fucking brutal. Five. I sat at the flea market digging through the 25-cent cardboard box of abandoned black-and-white mid-century photographs that were rescued from God knows where. There's a picture of two army men in brown soldier suits sitting in a booth of a bar, one's hands around the other. Their sleeves are rolled up, and as you would expect, the more feminine one looks totally fucking wasted. You can tell these two men are fucking. Six. To this day, it is a made-for-TV movie set in the 70s, if I could guess. I saw it on the midday movie slot my local station had growing up. I had to be about six, I think. A woman attends an award ceremony where she walks the red carpet alone and some bitch out of nowhere in a very audible voice says, why is she alone? She wins a big award and says something to the effect of, I have had to sell many things for this award. Sometimes I've had to sell my body. And starts crying on the mic and heaven fucking help her. I think some people start booing her and she runs out of the theater crying. Even as a young boy, I know this is a total fucking carry. What I can't explain is why even after all these years, I still get this deep knife twisted in gut feeling of sadness for her. Like how has that feeling maintained itself so fucking fresh? Like I locked it in a Ziploc bag for 30 years and kept it. Eight. I saw a picture of this woman. My mother had a copy. In fact, it looks like my mother, like totally just like her, but I know it's not my mother because the picture was taken in the 40s. I know it's the 40s because the entirety of my family has pictures of my grand-grandparents and older great-aunts and uncles from this period, always taken at the county fair each year, their southern black faces moisturized with Vaseline and glistening in sepia-toned photographs. That's your great-aunt Cecilia. She died at 19. It goes that she fell one day, but really, her husband killed her. I felt this wave of vengeance wash over me. I was drunk and almost posted, RIP my beautiful Aunt Cecilia, victim of domestic violence. And my mother ripped the phone from my hand. It will hurt your grandfather to read that. She was his favorite sister. And heaven help me, I paused and couldn't take my eyes off my mother. I could not separate her from the woman in the picture. I could not separate the woman in the picture from myself. I really like the Justin Torres section, in particular because we don't distinguish between poetry, fiction, nonfiction. It's kind of just all in there, all as one thing. And this one is sort of about art. It's about photographs, but also about family stuff. Like It just bends all the genres. So you should take a look at it. Um, that's issue 31.2. 
And now I have a poem about me trying to figure out my teenage years, which were, as of course, tumultuous. Poem for the girl who loves girls. No empty merry-go-rounds. No visible scars through the holes in your jeans. No trading painkillers on the swings. No signatures under pink and green chucks. No after-sex cigarettes. No, we should be in a movie speech. Don't steal her dad's car. Don't shave her in the shower or take pictures of her Barbasol bikini. No pretend threesomes. Nobody will ever know about us, a secret. No holding a baby finch in your hand, small as a raisin. No tossing the ones that don't make it into the trash. No seeing her in the orange trees, in cracked sea glass. No dreaming. No, you can't dream yet. At the museum, like us right now. <laughs> <laughs> I watch a sparrow circle the glass ceiling like wool in a spindle. The world was temporary, now barred from him. He will soon die of exhaustion. Marble nudes, milky rivers frozen in the midst of turmoil or eros line the atrium. Most people stop at the occasional statue, speak to their partners, and do not notice the bird. A woman with a blank notebook examines a painting of an abstract man. I find myself hating it. I ask her why she carries the notebook, and she says, I never remember the paintings. I say, the red here is hard to forget. I think it means blood and warfare. She tells me, I don't think we're allowed to understand. I don't know what any of it means. Once, in another museum, you asked me to tell you a story about the painting we stood in front of. It had thick black strokes as if composed with crude oil. I spoke of a building collapsing into a river. You said, none of these artists knew about sex, not really. We kissed in a dark exhibit like teenagers. Months later, I asked you which poems we read in bed that morning, and I believed your answer. One was about a man in a museum. Forgetting is my only way to let go of cruelty. And which janitor, sweeping around the white bodies at night, will find the fallen sparrow? Will they be the kind of person who has experience, who will think nothing of tossing the bird into a bin? I still hope he might be there first, that they pause to fan out his feathers with rough hands. Love poem, Fox. The dogs sing in the wood, and I marvel at their song. O oh, caved-in burrow, O oh, stench, marriage of my betrayal. To dress myself in woman would be a finer sport. A rich man would offer a gloved palm toward the furl of my unnatural grin. Here, I damn the mocking trees, the man on his horse, his gloves. Love, that you might be the silver of a stream, the dark of a lake, my refuge in the hunt. Or you might be one to drown me. Um, and this is my last poem, and this is the one in the poetry supplement for this thing, which is downstairs, right? Cool. It's called Shot Glass. Uh, and I've got a little quote, epigraph, uh, from Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, actually, and I didn't even know he was going to be in this thing. And I didn't know we were going to publish him in Gulf Coast, so that ended up working out. And uh, he says in a documentary about Marsha P. Johnson, which is excellent, and you can watch the whole thing on YouTube, he says, gay people were scheduled for non-existence. I enjoy the reveal most. Glimpse of pantyhose thighs taut and glittering before a dress becomes another elaborate dress, a wig torn off to show the other. The dance is a bloom. She is the room, our collective sip of vodka. I tell my male friends I feel safest here. Harness bartenders, butch girls nodding along in collared shirts, my hips swaying in time. I am most aware of my own body. Once, in Greece, I misread it all. We had done the glances, shy and then not shy. Men danced in cages, shirtless, glistening as if they had emerged from the sea. A silver sign over the bar read, by sensual life curious, sorry boys, I like pussy. She and I had matching piercings and she pretended not to know English. I asked for permission. 
No, no, she said. Then I asked louder so she could understand. Here the dance is different. Here I am unmade by the music. Our laser lit clearing in the aftermath of a drag show is miles from disobedience. A shot glass cracking a mirror. A lesbian arrested with a head wound. Uniformed men locked in a burning building. Bricks, the heaviest objects thrown. I take selfies against murals of men wearing leather. I am wearing leather. Women press their lips to my neck. Here, the only threat is the one we try our best to quell. We keep low in the gut. We shuffle to a corner. Somewhere in America, there is a man who would like nothing better than to enter this bar with a gun. Thank you. Um, thank you to Joe, and that was great, Paige. Um, my name's Robin Riegler, and I'm gonna start with a poem by uh, Cameron Awkward Rich. It's Cinto Between the Ending and the End. Here you go. Sometimes you don't die when you're supposed to, and now I have a choice, repair a world or build a new one. Inside my body, a white door opens into a place queerly brimming, gold light to velvet gold. It is like the world hasn't happened. When I call out, all my friends are there. Everyone we love is still alive, gathered at the lakeside like constellations. My honeyed kin, honeyed light beneath the sky, a garden, blue stalks, white buds, the moon's marble glow, the fire distant and flickering, the the body whole, bright-winged, brimming, with the hours of the day, beautiful, nameless planet. Oh, friends, my friends, bloom how you must, wild, until we are free. Um, I picked a cento because it's kind of a collage of many other poets' lines, and so in this poem, Cameron is putting together a collection of sort of, a sort of homage to poets that have been inspiring, so. Okay. And I have a few that I've done. The, the first one is, is from uh, Teeth and Teeth, and it's called Fear, Desire, Fire. Deep inside me, the hawks are circling again. Their single-mindedness blitzes in and prepares for some kind of fight. With effort, I manage to control my face, but I carefully avoid the cameras. I walk as though I am not completely visible. When I arrive before you, it is as an acolyte waiting to be taught. <laughs> I dream of escaping the terror that I might simply become. There are many ways to tell any story. My body is the lesbian body. And when in darkness you come to me, I struggle to believe you're real. Then I, the self who is nobody, begin to burn, and I am lit up and wed to the fields on fire. That is called flying, and there is nothing like it, nothing before it, nothing after it. Um, this next poem I, I wanted to read for my daughter, Carrie, who is here tonight. <laughs> yes, she said, oh, no, that's right. Uh, my children are teenagers, and they greet such dedications with, oh, no. <laughs> um, Carrie is, uh, I think, of as perhaps the last Shakespearean. She is a, uh, she's found other last Shakespeareans, but um, this is called Unlikely Ophelia, so it's Ophelia from Hamlet. Unlikely Ophelia. 
She looked in the mirror. There was her mother. She looked again. She was playing a visual echo, the pain of her loss through pebbles at the painted clouds. Parents die, leaving us, haunting us. Here is Ophelia. Somebody needs to do something, somebody who could touch her in a way that says, cradle. The moon is so tiny, I can barely see. Faith breaks into shatters in slow motion, and the reflection is disguised as her mother. Her love shot out of a cannon, not a ball, but a sleeping baby. She looks again, and there is her mother, lost and labored breath, celebrating echoes. I have a bad feeling about desire, which, which once kept me alive and hopeful, yet in every cell of our bodies, we are subjects. And where is the king? Where is the map? An old man takes a nap on a postage stamp. This is all a trick, a dream. Wake me up right now. Where are all the women we depend on each other? Our collective potential is empire. We're not playing anymore. The corpses blanket the stage, which turns into stone, which turns into story, the desire tilting upward and rising so that you reach a point where you can look down on your mother who is kneeling below you and you are missing her so much it hurts. You're waiting for her, although the actors take a bow. It's over. You're talking to the sliced moon, straining to brighten a dull yellow sky. And now outside, the only way out, diving into the freezing cold, just because it would be better to feel something, anything, everything else. This is called The How and the Why. <laughs> but mostly, I think about love. I think about you. I think about time as the ocean and our stories as boats made of paper. The fragility of our stories, the unlikeliness of love, and the tomboy certainty of a childhood in Arkansas where I swallowed my fear and felt things secretly, then not at all. I think about the ocean, the engineering within ocean waves. I feel the technicality of my body as a part of the waves, the pull and suck of tides, the moon as a kind of kindness, masterminding the landscape. I feel cottish the Hebrew prayer providing rhythm for just how the living will remember the dead. I swear to you, in certain moments, I can see the hidden architecture inside living things in the natural world. I remember darkness. I remember my mother, the way she held her jaw like stone and maintained that terseness even as she was dying. I think about her. I think about you and my words as bricks that sink deeper and deeper as bricks dreaming their way back into the earth. And this last one is so new, it doesn't have a title yet. Um, I wrote part of it with my daughter Pearl, who is also here. Would you like to say, oh no? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, she's a, uh, don't tell her I told you, but she, she's a creative writing student at HSPVA. And uh, so we write together sometimes, and that's pretty cool. Um, here we go. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed that there's always a dog outside? How some nights you get to choose your own mood how the faraway sounds of the freeway 
half harmonize with the rumble of freight trains heaving across the bridge. How the sky smokes into life when it's chilly. No, not really, but you are willing to wonder with me, aren't you? Well, have you ever dreamed a meadow filled with giant rabbits representing sexual tenderness? Do you remember the difference between fear and desire? Are you the glue keeping other people barely together? Is the heart really a muscle? Can a 21st century human die of loneliness? Would you join me in the telling room? I just want to talk. I want to crack open the story twice underneath the magnolia trees where we speak in the greenest words we know. Thanks. That was terrific, Robin. Thank you, Joseph and Felice, for the invitation. And thanks to all of you for being here this evening. And thank you, Lyric, for reading a poem by Audre Lord. I, too, will read a poem by Audre Lord. I mean, one of the things about queerness is that we get to reimagine desire. And it seems to me that eroticism is going to be one of the, the themes in the three poems that I'll read, uh, two by others and one of mine. Audrey Lord. On a night of the full moon. Out of my flesh that hungers and my mouth that knows comes the shape I am seeking for reason. The curve of your body fits my waiting hand. Your flesh warm as sunlight. Your lips quick as young birds. Between your thighs the sweet sharp taste of limes. Thus I hold you, frank in my heart's eye, in my skin's knowing. As my fingers conceive your flesh, I feel your stomach curving against mine. Before the moon wanes again, we shall come together. And I would be the moon, spoken over your beckoning flesh, breaking against reservations, breaching thought, my hands at your high tide, over and under inside you, and the passing of hungers attended, forgotten. Darkly risen, the moon speaks, my eyes judging your roundness, delightful. The next poem I want to read um, is a tribute to one of our great poets who passed this year, uh, my friend Kevin Killian, who was influential in the San Francisco New Narrative community. And uh, I remember reading his poems as early as the 1990s that eventually became the book that I'm going to read from called the Argento series. And what's spectacular about this book is that he manages to do the unthinkable, which is to talk about the AIDS epidemic by using the metaphor of the horror films of the great Italian stylized uh, horror filmmaker Dario Argento and using popular culture like Jesus Christ Superstar. And the combination, I think, is really riveting. Zombie. Father who keeps one great yellow eye peeled for the boy, don't let him grow up to be that peeping Tom with the German accent. Father of definition, let no glaucoma take him behind the screen of white china. He's my little wriggling thing I eat like a jujube. Out of your mouth, you spewed me like catfish, lukewarm, whiskered, hot diggity dog, said the other children, crowding, crowding round my genitals as though on bonfire. But then, coming back to school to pray, heads bowed, Father, who makes this body of sense go stupid whenever I see you burning in that berry bush, keep your guard down till over your self-defense I leap. I once did ooze, but now I'm hard. I'll become lard if a prayerful sort. 
dance class at noon, I expect every mine hair to take that duty dinner at seven-ish. Little gummy green bear assails us at a table with news of the soup on the left, big bowl of snapdragons floating in the warm water of the. Dear God, as I lay dying of AIDS, I pray to you in all your ministries nightly and daily. And you were out in school teaching us the colors of the fag. Dear God, let me freeze up his serious T cells into miasma and bring him alive into the 23rd century. I can't lose everything. Not in one day, Jesus fucking Christ. I'll bring corpse after corpse to wash your feet with, to open a closet with a bullet in space. Sleep if you are tired. Rest if you feel trenchant. Father of HIV, stop the digital maniplex. Close your eyes, close your eyes, relax. Think of nothing tonight. For those of you who know Jesus Christ Superstar, that's the Mary Magdalene song. Um, and I'll end with a, a poem from uh, Full Foreground, which uses eroticism, I think, to talk also about sort of um, uh, that the desire is also a sort of political being in the world. A reverence in the order of time arises now some undersurface into silk geometries of here therefore, observing the swerve of lawful aim as pliant capacity curls into what could be weeks of this unlikely touch. Deserving tongues, synod, plead the here and after unto shores kept safe between the pages of an ark outlive us, escape and case in point. Render unshaven this day our cupped hands, unsure along the lilt of jaw rejoin your collarbone allure made known and roseate and hollow. In the shape of lissom night, recede to surge again, my throat moan in the fraught mind and bodily intentions of is this a kiss, a head swell grin of abandoned contiguity of mouths, glide drunk with the persuaded hearts surrendering apparel. Am I watching these soft drawn tenses of fragrant beige or so inside your amulet anatomy? If there's no jeopardy to these offices of the flesh, jewel pressed against this all involving spot, then it's a rapture uncertain, this company rare. And where on the horizon was it over the summer, so numb therewith, now a winter hum of knowing a science, something no one need notice? If this is gift given, or spellbound, or a thievery, else this is dumbstruck, and falling asleep there outside of this rattle, shall we gather, O van vanguard of God, as we pleasure on the other edge of this election year, my luminary, in whose rogue nation, to imagine a commonwealth, is to make impossible a casualty in this occurrence. Thanks. Hello again. I want to read one more poem by someone else, someone not here, uh, from an extraordinary book recently published called Field by Joss Charles. And these are untitled, they're numbered. Tonight I would love to write the moth in the garden, to grieve it, and as a matter of form, did you know, not a month goes by, a tram I know doesn't die. Just shy of 27, it's such a pleasure to be alive. In this trembled suit you lent, shock is a structured response, a word lost in the mouth of keepers. <clears throat> And you thumb at the moth, a dozen bees. I tethered these nights. I gathered so many trees. If you don't know that book, it's an extraordinary book about trans experience and desire written in a kind of medieval Chaucerian language. And I have learned a lot from it because I think it's true to understand ourselves and others, we sometimes need acts of strange translation. I just want to read a few poems before we go. I'm really pleased to read, after all of these extraordinary writers, um, I'm really pleased to read 
um, in front of these extraordinary images. I write because I become fascinated with things like icons. Um, the book of poems I've just published is really caught up with Life magazine. Um, and would I be a gay poet if I didn't read at least one poem from Marilyn Monroe? Um, this is from Marilyn Monroe. It's called Fall of a Star. It refers to a cover of, uh, she's on the cover of a November 9, 1959 issue. Teeth clenched, the star arched in the manner suggesting the shape of other women. Lillian Russell, Theda Barra, Jean Harlow, Marlena Dietrich. Hope, 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 she wrote in 1956 of another marriage destined to end. But in 1959, she leapt into the air, only one of a number of luminaries. Brigitte Bardot, Audrey Hepburn, Sophia Loren, all, as the photographer put it, child women who have been raised to the level of goddesses by insecure men. You can tell everything by the way a body surrenders the ground. Watch Richard Nixon rise as Adlai Stevenson falls. See J. Robert, J. Robert Oppenheimer launch his slender body upward, one finger nearly touching the sky. I was just reaching, he said, just reaching into a sky lit by the radiance of innumerable suns, the whole world full of infinite possibility in the form of death. Death, destroyer of worlds, comes in his dark suit for the woman in black, Marilyn Monroe, leaping above a barren shore, her legs pinned behind her body. In 1962, no hope remained. No body cast off the weight of earthly obligation. What won't appear in the magazines appears in the morgue, surly snapshot of a bitter end, the hair cascading down, the skin and flesh sinking down like the dusky brim of a mushroom cloud, the world so hot, so full of motes of starry dust hidden in the dark privacies of plain sight that everything rises just long enough to fall back down. The extraordinary thing about um, working on this book and looking at those issues is that the poems, everything in the poems happens. A photographer asked really famous people to jump, and he photographed them. And it was a sort of extraordinary cast of characters, including the father of the atomic bomb. Um, at one point, I don't remember when, it was at sometime in my teen years, my father told me, no, my mother told me the story that when I was born, my grandfather gave my father $50, a $50 bill, I guess a lot of money in that time, and um, a cigar, which he didn't smoke. And um, I think I was told that story that was supposed to be exciting, but I just found it weird. What is there to say? <laughs> this is called Wrinkle. Your lungs fill a hospital, your $50 scream. Someone lifts the squalling body, force of the sinister hand. Your sex, your uncertainty, a lit cigar. Your sister tells you the story. Someone's father's father's, your girlish disappointments. Wheel the thing from one machine to the next. The green he takes in the other hand, it is right. She would drink your blood if she weren't drinking her own. You flesh, you stem, you your mother's redolence. Which is the hand that holds, that strikes, that will dispense? Smoke billowing over a crib. He has arrived, he's arrived. You can start your dying now. You were the brother of envy, the sister of doubt. That song was never yours. That song was never offered you. The men, they smile, they nod. Where has your mother gone? Time will stretch the skin smooth as a fresh pressed bill. From mouth to mouth, from hand to hand, take it. Green stalk of longing, what are you worth anyway? Yeah, my sister was not as pleased about that story, and she was the firstborn, so I don't blame her. 
uh, read one last uh, poem. It, like this, the poem I just read, it's, it's more of a series of images drawn from um, the April 28th, 1972 issue of Life magazine called The Marriage Experiment. And when I think about so many things politically, I kind of think, wow, what happened since 1972? They were already talking about how interesting and complex many kinds of unions were. And it only took 35 years later to validate some more of those unions. It featured um, a sort of polyamorous collectivity. It featured um, straight men and women in very sort of, for that moment, at least unusual arrangements. It featured some gays and lesbians. Um, I found, too, in my sort of time with Life magazine, um, they didn't cover the Stonewall riots, which is interesting. Um, I write because I'm inspired by icons, but also by history. Um, they did cover some r riots. There was a a piece in 71 called Homosexuals in Revolt caused quite a stir. Um, and an earlier piece in 64 called Homosexuality in America with some very sort of dark, shady images um, meant not to be particularly clear. Um, and it's fascinating to really think a lot about um, how it was possible to be represented at certain moments, and if it was possible. Um, and I think as much as we feel in a very different moment now, there's still a lot to think about, a lot to worry about. So this is called Union, April 28, 1972. I also, I get to read it um, just, I would say, what, a year and a couple months after I married my husband, who's here tonight, which is, I don't know, something that we ever thought we would do exactly. Strange how the times change. Union, April 28, 1972. No paper to stain, no contract to bind. The hand that grasps a bloody mist grasps nothing. A bull flipping over and over its horns. Favor me with your eye, favor me with your lip. Drawn between them, the man and the woman. For this I spent, for this I labored. Coal in its obsolescence, steam in its ever presence. A hand grasps a hand, grasping another hand. What was it you said? Oh, corporation, fast breeding, new day, new world. Every whisper and glance, instant festivity. If you look at the sea, you will see churning flowers. The sheet winds and winds and winds, whose hands about my heart what not tighten my throat. Witness, you say, eager to be perceived. One hand a flower, one a torch. One alone I asked to see me, alone one would. What perfect. What union. Thanks very much, and thank you very much for coming tonight.